I didn't really know what I was letting myself in for. We just lost control. I just felt it was best to get as far away as possible. I was just convinced he was dead. As soon as I saw it, I knew it had been cut. I thought, this is it. This is as far as this game goes. One and all, welcome to the latest, the greatest, the June theme edition of Nick's Nonfiction. You better be excited. I'm the edge of your seat. This is Joe Simpson's Touching the Void. It's a cliffhanger. It's a nail biter. My mom used to put hot sauce on my fingernails to stop me from biting them. Now it's the only way I can eat them. Crap laugh. If you're a nail biter, you're going to learn to control that impulse along with many other in today's story. We're pushing past mental barriers, perseverance. Joe Simpson and his climbing partner, Simon Yates, yeet, had just reached the top of a 21,000 foot peak when disaster struck. <laughs> Simpson plunged off the vertical face of an ice ledge. He broke his leg. No medical evacs that high. These men wish they could have disappeared into thin air. <laughs> That's hot air right there. The following three days on the mountain were a grueling ordeal, starvation, severe frostbite, crippling injuries, being trapped in crevasses. It's going to get personal today. Is it crevice or I guess a crevasse is the fancy man's way. As your host, I'm going to be presenting from the side of survival. That's always the theme here. I will survive. I suck off, guys. <laughs> Thank you. I sing great. I hear you guys out there complaining. Mountains aren't funny. Maybe so, but they are hill areas. Why are mountaineers always tired? Because they don't ever rest. What sound does a Swiss donkey make on a mountain? Yole hee haw! You'll see how funny mountains get today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back with you about the author. Stay tuned. Let's play. About the author Joe Simpson. Follow the memes, for God's sake, they're free and they're hilarious. I respond to DMs pretty infrequently there. Actually, someone called me out recently. It was funny. I liked one of their messages, and he goes, dude, it's been five months. <laughs> if you message me on Patreon, I'll get back to you immediately. Patreon.com slash the niche. Joe Simpson, this guy understands mountains, the beautiful boulders. He never takes them for granted. This story shall be good. Don't be igneous. Hell yeah, baby. I'm just warming up. This beer is helping. Simpson was born on the 13th of April, 1960, to a Scottish father and an Irish mother in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. What the heck? And he's a little British boy as well. You ever hear that old uh, Malaysian airliner joke? I can't tell it here. The algorithm will shoot me down in flames. <laughs> Malaysian airline, look into it. <laughs> Simpson began rock climbing after being introduced to the sport at Peak Scar on the Hambleton Hills in northeastern Yorkshire by a teacher at Ampleforth College. That's the most goofy ass British sentence I've ever said. I think one of my teeth rotted out. The Hambleton Yorkshire Hills. What the hell? <laughs> this is a fairy tale. What do you call a rock climbing rabbi? Mountain Jew. <laughs> and when he falls, it's a code red. And what about when he denies the fall? Hitler did nothing wrong. Those are all uh, Mountain Dew flavors. That's deep dew humor for the boys, the gamers. Simpson went to the Andes and yeah, he summited Suila Grande. 
This was the one that everyone was scared to. Cost him six surgical operations, but it's worth it. What did the pilot say before he crashed into the mountain? Kobe! <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back to start this dang thing. was awesome joe simpson touching the vag void chapter one beneath the mountain lakes you're gonna get a healthy serving of joe simpson quotes this book uh yeah a lot of narration coming out just to warn you low on the laughs uh. i was lying in my sleeping bag starting at the light filtering through the red and green fabric on the dome tent simon was snoring loudly occasionally twitching in his dream world he streams Twitch in his dream? Uh, we would have been anywhere. There is a peculiar anonymity about being intense. Nemo, it's anemone. Once the zip is closed around the outside world barred from the skin, they're in a tent and they're about to have Brokeback Mountain sex together. Camping has his own comforts is the whole point of that. He kept saying the word comfort. Yeah, you clutch onto the small things even when you're in a tent. And he's going to have to be clutching onto much smaller things. It's cold on the mountain. He's got a micro dick. <laughs> Camping. You know, it teaches you about the small things. A majority of girls won't camp because of bugs. Insects are a feature of Mother Nature's program. It isn't a bug. <laughs> Kept you hanging on to that one. It's not a feature. It's a bug. And it's the little things that get people angry when you should, like, look at bugs and imagine if they were the size of Godzilla. Dude, I love bugs. <laughs> the boys were in the middle of the Cordillera Hoyahuasha. It's the Peruvian Andes, and they're in this separated village 28 miles from the nearest uh, phone. Surrounded by ice caps, they're hearing avalanches starting to fall in the distance. Night passes, Joe writes, It had snowed a little during the night, and the grass crunchy frostily under my feet was starting to crack. There was no sign of Richard stirring as I passed his tiny one-man tent, half-collapsed, whitened, with Hoar Frost. Hoar Frost? That's a good stripper name. The first quote made it sound like they're sharing a tent. And this one, yeah, I guess they have their individuality. Not pertinent. <laughs> quote, rising from the sea of moraines to my left, so he's starting to get out of the crunchy grass now, Two spectacular and extravagant castles of sugar icing. Eurepa and Razak dominated the campsite. A majestic 21-foot-tall Suila Grande lay behind Sarapo and was not visible. It had been climbed for the first time in 1936 by two bold Germans via the North Ridge. There had been few ascents since, and the true prize, the daunting 4,500-foot west face, had so far defeated all attempts. Hmm. What's with all the Germans in these climbing books? Are there carabiners made by Mercedes? I thought that's what a Mexican in Jamaica is called. A carabiner. <laughs> Joe's wandering over to the cooking rock they have at their campsite, eating some breakfast. Yeah, they're boiling down snow to go. He's saying Nalgene's are the whole thing. Yeah, Mountain Dew, buy a Subaru. Now he's quoting his partner. Well, I'm not the full ticket, but I reckon I'm over the worst. It was bloody freezing last night. I wondered if it was the altitude rather than the kidney bean stew that was getting to him. Our tents were pitched at 15,000 feet. He was no mountaineer. That's as high as they get in America. That's base camp Everest height. You can't even light a lighter. It's wild. You need matches. Joe and Yeet, they're 80 miles from the airport. They're talking a big game. By the end of the second day, Richard was feeling the effects of altitude. Yeah, the airliners are waving to them on the way for takeoff. That night, Joe said he had hallucinations of leaving Richard behind. Hmm, is that a premonition? Getting into the meat of this first chapter. 19 May 1985, base camp. Heavy frost last night, clear skies this morning. I'm trying to adjust to being here. It feels menacingly remote and exhilarating at the same time. 
So much so better than the Alps. No hordes of climbers, no helicopters, no rescue. Just us and the mountains. Life seems far simpler, more real. It's easy to let events and emotions flow past us without stopping to look. He's on mountain time now. He's continuing to describe more weather patterns. And he's saying it's very much different than the Alps. Even more unpredictable of a biome. In Patagonia, he says afternoons have cumulus clouds and always amount with snowfall and rain. So he's spending a couple of days acclimatizing. We get a biography of his partner here. Yates, finally. Yeah. Tall and powerfully built, he possessed most of life's advantages and few of the drawbacks. He was an easy friend, dependable, sincere, ready to see life as a joke. He had a thatch of blonde hair, blue eyes, laughing eyes, that touch of madness, which makes just a few people so special. I was glad that we had chosen to come here as two-man team. There were a few other people I could have coped with for so long. Simon was everything that I was not everything that I would like to have been. Uh, yeah, that's a real bromance here. Also mentioned Simon is undergoing extreme nicotine withdrawal. And your lighter doesn't work, so we better have brought the nicorette. <laughs> Wasn't Chantix released in the 80s and then it gave people cancer? Irrelevant. They're headed for Suila Grande, quote, the final summit pyramid of Europea was f by far the highest mountain to be seen and dominated our view as it reared, glistening with ice, fresh snow, high above Suila Glacier. So they're like a handful of miles, just getting zapped by altitude, maybe at around 18,000 feet. And that was the highest that he had ever done in the European Alps, Mount Blanc, 18,000. So they're going to be sleeping above that. <laughs> it's another reason they can't travel far in a single day is because of the afternoon storms. So it's taking them a long time. The two spend a couple of days planning their next objective. And then Richard rolls up. <laughs> Some guy in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they're like, how did you get here? He says, people at base camp told me where you were going. <laughs> so he just tags along for the remainder of the hike. Quote, our next objective was to be unclimbed south ridge of Cerro Yantarari, only a short walk across the riverbed from our tents. Weather's holding out, long day of trekking. You know, it's a classic story here. They're passing yaks and touching prayer flags, having lemon tea. Quote, the next day we left the camp early for Yanaturi. It was an insuspicious start. The screes proved highly dangerous with stone falls smacking down on them from high on the ruble ribbon western face above us. Rubble? No, there were Russian rubles. <laughs> Coins coming down the mountain. Joe hit us with a false start, you know. He's not really at the trailhead yet, even. You can tell Joe is paranoid. He says, For two whole days we gorged ourselves on food and sunshine preparing for the west face. I began to feel spasms of fear now that we were committed to Swila. In the next fine weather window. Yo, when you know you're committing, that's when the waves of fear start trying to smack you around, turn you upside down. Richard goes, five days is a very long time, especially on your own with no one to talk to. So Richard <laughs> <coughs> took five days between base camp and catching up to them. That's nuts. He's talking about an 80-foot ice wall that came up too. <laughs> time to break out the climbing equipment. To get past and up our glacier, we would have to negotiate a short, steep ice clip some 80 to 100 feet high. Large rocks were balanced precariously above the line of ascent and rubles. Richard took the picture of Joe and Yeet on the top of the world. Like, this is the last picture of the two of them ever seen. And so Richard didn't bring any hiking equipment or climbing stuff. So this was his time he had to turn back. Another five days of solo back to base camp. He has the last picture of these men. <laughs> Chapter 2, Tempting Fate. Joe wakes up. Now it is all-time highest altitude. And he's got freezing fingertips for the first morning. Quote, I'll go first, shall I? Simon said, knowing he had me at a disadvantage. I nodded miserably, and he set off up the avalanche cone above our snow hole towards the ice field, which reared up in the blue early morning ice. Every area is a treacherous, 
playground territory. Like, mistakes are more common than success here. No one's ever climbed this part. Moving up, quote, keep looking at your feet. Swing up, hook up, swing up, you know, swing all the way up. 150 feet, no effort, no headache. He's looking one step ahead of him. This is the climber's tip, and this is the stoic thing. Just focus on one step ahead of you. Don't look at all the other climbers around you. Moving on, the boys, they're keeping their heads down for maybe too long. Quote, we climbed higher, 1,000, 2,000 feet, until we wondered when this ice field would end, and the rhythm became ragged with the monotony. We would keep up to our right, up to our right, following the line we had chosen a line that now looked different with the shortened perspective. You know, mountain perspective is deceptive. <laughs> it's almost as difficult to get a topological read on a girl's face when she's caked it with makeup. Oh, got him. You know, they're on Mount Sephora. Oh. <laughs> Bro, distance and height are very hard to judge. You need like a golf range finder when you're doing mountain climbing. And these guys are kind of just drifting up one, two thousand feet. That's quite a while, half a mile. Only way out of this pickle, Joe says, we had to find the steep ice color which ran up through the sides of this butress and would eventually lead us into the wide hanging gully we had seen from Sierra Norte. They would be the key to the climb. We had under six hours to find it, climb it, and dig a comfortable snow cave in the gully above. Got a do-or-die moment on the side of a friggin' mountain here. Keeps going, suddenly the day seemed less casual and relaxed. <laughs> Woo, the waves of fear are gonna start to pick back up. I watched Simon's progress now, agonizingly slow and hunched up, my hair bristling at the thought of Cornus collapsing. I followed him as fast as I could. He too had realized the danger. Yo! Books aren't lame, bro. I'm coursing with adrenaline right now. <laughs> they had helmets on, and Joe said he was getting peppered by all these stray rocks coming down. Rubles. <laughs> that joke's not going to get old for me. I shouted down to Simon when I reached the coal ore again, but I couldn't hear his reply. Spindrift powder rushed down in a brushful from above. Unexpected, it made my heart leap. Oh, man. Bro, I went to the world's tallest suspension bridge recently. It's in Colorado, and I felt like a gust of wind behind my back. <laughs> Yo, I think some people thought I was going to jump. <laughs> Yo, that's a scary feeling when you're on an edge and you feel wind behind you. Spindrift. Nah, it's the name of a girly drink. Spindrift will kill you. <laughs> Quote, I had no ice skews. I had a forgotten to take... Had a forgotten to take them from Simon and had used my only screw down at the bottom. I did not know what to do. 120 feet up, very steep ice, go back down. I was scared of the unprotected drop beneath me and of the idea of needing an ice screw for a belay if I couldn't find any rock. I shouted again, but there was no reply. Take a few breaths and go on with it. Joe is talking to himself, deciding to escort Yeet via the rope. So, you know classic ice climber scene the wind has gotten so bad that they can't see each other they can only feel each other through their umbilical cords and they both wind up making it up this 120 foot ice wall <laughs> bad decisions from before they're having to pay for it now quote before it had darkened i had spotted that we were slightly off route and yeah this kind of drags out a little bit more he goes 150 feet off course no doubt we would have to resort to complicated diagonal assembling in the morning to get past it. So that fancy ice cave they were planning, they're going to have to sleep on the side of the stormy ice wall Suila Grande. Quote, I was inside a protective waterproof bivouac bag, half in, that's not how you say it. <laughs> Simon was making final adjustments to his safety line. Suddenly and without warning, I felt myself drop swiftly. Simultaneously, there was an ear-splitting roar and grinding. <laughs> this story should end right here. Oh, it's such a good cliffhanger. With my head inside the bag and my arms falling outside the opening at my chest, so he's like a half-hot pocket now, I knew nothing except the sickness dread as I went plummeting down into the 2,000-foot abyss below. 
I heard a high-pitched yelp of fear amid the heavy roaring, then felt a springy recoil. The safety rope had held. All my weight was held on my armpits as I had accidentally caught the safety rope in the fall. Living on the edge! The thunderous sound of tons of granite plunging down the pillar echoed and then died in silence. I was completely disoriented. The silence seemed frighteningly ominous. A couple of guys just hanging out on the side of a mountain, right? Quote, there was a good deal of nervous swearing and hysterical giggling as gradually we became aware of the seriousness of our position. The situation is far worse. You know, they're realizing it moment by moment. Joe is dangling like a turd on the side of a mountain with his arms hanging out of his sleeping bag. And Simon is the only thing holding him from a 2,000 foot fall into the abyss. It looked as if one of the two attachment points would give away at any moment. We knew that if just one anchor point failed, we would both be hurled into the void. We quickly searched for our equipment to see how we might improve the anchors, only to find that all of it, including our boots, had fallen with the ledge. So confident had we been in the safety of the ledge that we hadn't thought it necessary to clip our gear to the rope. We could do nothing. Oh, Jesus, man, they're bootless. 2,000, 20,000 feet in the air. I'm starting to get goosebumps. The closest ledge, he said, it was like 200 feet below him. <laughs> so you would probably tumble the full 2,000. But this is a bone-breaking fall. <laughs> he says trying to go up or down would have been suicidal. And yeah, so he's just dangling there. How does the saga end, you ask? Quote, we hung on that fragile rope for 12 interminable hours. Eventually our shouts were heard and a rescue helicopter succeeded in plucking us from the wall. I had to mislead you guys a little bit. That's not how the real bad part starts. These guys go back to base camp and then they're going to go back up on the mountain. They live for that adrenaline. He wanted to be dangling. Chapter 3, Storming the Summit. They got the Sila Norte situation behind them. Everybody's uh, uninjured. That guy <laughs> that tried to catch up with them on the ice wall, he uh, caught up with them back at base camp. Yeah. Recounting the story, Joe had a quote. We had been on the mountain for over 50 hours and perhaps had become attuned to potential threats, so much so that I had sensed something would happen without understanding quite what it would be. Like, when that storm started rolling in, I said, you know, there's always that one decision, and that time he realized it. Is he going to be able to act on that in the future? So they're going to try to go over to Suila Grande again, never break in the action. When they reached the head wall, Simon had seen the leading Japanese climber fall outward and backward, arms outstretched in surprise. The awesome 2,500-foot plunge, visible through breaks in the clouds, was framed behind him. To his horror, he had seen the falling leader jerk and twist, and without a sound, pull his partner into the void. That's what Joe could have so easily done to his partner being the dangling turd before. The two men plunged down, roped together helplessly. It's a scary sight. <laughs> he watched it. It's like the same story in the Everest book. The Japanese team just walked into the darkness. They got hypothermia and took off all their parkas. One guy, like, peeled his nose off. <laughs> Bro, it's a scary movie up there. Quote, I could remember seeing Simon walking slowly into the camp outside Chamonix when we got back. That's the name of the camp. He was subdued and looked drawn and tired. He had sat numb repeatedly questioning why his own tumble had been held on the same pitten just before the Japanese leader. Whew, so they're around the same point that they fell when they saw this guy. And Joe was wondering, you know, <laughs> what did I just get lucky? He's going to get a lot more luck. We're going to have to analyze if it's luck or if it's this guy's decision-making process. It's better to die than to live with survivor's guilt. That's what some mountaineers say. 
I don't know if I believe this. I think I'd rather have my life. <laughs> but Simon and Joe seems to have shaken that off pretty easily. They're ready to test their luck again immediately. <laughs> when you're off grid, never feel guilty about ingesting a parasite. It'll eat you from the inside out. Going along to chapter four, disaster. <gasps> I think this calls for another beverage. Let's go. Joe, just about seen enough at this point, quote, I began to feel impatient. I was tired of this grinding need to concentrate all the time. The mountain had lost its excitement, its novelty. I wanted to get off it as soon as possible. The air was bitingly cold and the sky cloudless. The sun burnt down in a dazzling glare on the endless snow and ice. You could... <laughs> I almost got snow blindness once. That ain't no joke. You're basically in the sun. He's obviously fatigued. He's going to need some teammate morale, some comms to get him back up. Quote, I had wanted Simon to lead on the last stretch, but had been unable to voice my apprehension and feared his response to it more than I feared another sickening fall. Damn. So he's just as scared of falling as hearing Simon go, dude, I'm feeling tired too. It's one of those things you can't ever say that you're tired. <laughs> he is still breaking trail, even though he wanted Simon to take point for a little bit. I suddenly found myself standing upright with my eyes level with the snow. The shallow fissure was filled with powder, so that however hard I thrashed about, I seemed to make no upward movement at all. <sighs> it's a tough place to hit a wall. It seriously feels like trying to run in a dream. We've got some videos on the Patreon where I'm post-holing walking in snow up to my you like you can't even pull your leg out it's just as hard walking on the moon give me a break <laughs> he's going snowshoes are less proficient than you think mm. i had fallen through quote so many times it was all one crevice all one long fracture line cutting right through the enormous humping cornices that made up the plateau he's making his own fault line in the mountain <laughs> avalanche time Stroke of luck here, too. At last I saw what I was looking for, a very slight break in the angle of the ice wall. The part of the cliff was still steep, nearly vertical, but not quite. It was about 20 feet high at the break. I felt sure at this point a few quick moves of reverse climbing would see me past the problem. And he's almost all the way up. The quote keeps going. I removed the ice axe embedded in the lip and lowered myself onto the hammer. As the hammer came out, there was a sharp, cracking sound, and my right hand gripping the axe pulled down. The sudden jerk turned me outwards, and instantly I was falling. I hit the slope at the base of the cliff before I saw it coming. I was facing into the slope, and both knees locked as I struck it. <laughs> yeah, they should make, like, ice choirs learn parkour rolls or something. <laughs> I felt a shattering blow in my knees, felt bones splitting, and I screamed. The impact catapulted me over backwards down the slope of the east face. I slid headfirst on my back. The rushing speed of it confused me. I thought of the drop below me, but felt nothing. Simon would be ripped off the mountains. He couldn't hold this. I screamed again as I jerked to the sudden, violent stop. Quote, everything was silent. My thoughts raced madly, then pain flooded down my thigh. A fierce burning fire continued down the inside of my thigh, seeming to ball in my groin. Building, a building fire, I cried out. Uh, my breathing came in my ragged grasps. My leg! Oh Jesus, my leg! I hung my head down on my back. Left leg tangled in the rope above me. Right leg hanging side to side. My leg! Nightmare moment here. Holy, he's fucking holding on by his broken legs. <sighs> you thought the sleeping bag was bad. <laughs> I'm waking up hanging. Whew. He swings himself to a slight incline. Some way he could rest his legs. How? You stick your ice pick into the wall, shove it up your ass to rest your weight. <laughs> He says his ears are ringing. He's uh, seeing in sepia. All the Call of Duty movies <laughs> when your partner double crosses you and throws you down a flight of stairs. 
He's seeing in slow motion. He says muscular tendon injuries induce synesthesia. So that's why he's like tasting sound. Whoa. As the adrenaline subsidizes and pain sets in, quote, I know I've broken my leg. That's it. I'm dead. Everyone said it. If there's just two of you, a broken leg or ankle could turn into death. If it's broken, if it doesn't hurt so much, maybe you've just ripped something. It's not very likely here. He says, I kicked my right leg against the slope, feeling sure it wasn't broken. My knee exploded. Oh! No! Bone grated, and the fireball rushed from groin to knee. I screamed. I looked down at the knee and couldn't see it was broken yet. I tried not to believe what I was seeing. It wasn't just broken. It was ruptured, twisted, crushed, and I could see the kink in the joint and knew what had happened. Sensitivity warning. The impact had driven my lower leg up through the knee joint. Oh, shit. <laughs> he said he'd uh, coped by telling himself it wasn't his leg, so he's just depersonalizing to try to... Wow, man. Nightmare. But that's what you got to do. Just go, I'm helping somebody whose leg is broken right now. He's like, there was no blood even. My knee turned into the size of a basketball. <laughs> he tries to stop moving, but the spasms take over his body. And remember, the ice pick is up his ass. So he's in all kinds of pain. He's getting that hot head. Nausea. Ugh. Imagine having the spits hanging off of a mountain face. <laughs> like, you think your hangovers are bad. Think of this guy next time. <laughs> Simon is, like, finally s trying to work his way down to him. And he gets to a point where he could make contact. What happened? 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 I fell, 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 fell. He says, the edge gave away. I paused. Then I said, as I unemotionally as I could... I've broken my leg. His expression changed instantly. I could see a whole range of reactions in his face. I kept looking directly at him. I wanted to miss nothing. Are you sure it's broken? Yes. Fuck. That's like, again, you never want to show your partner that you're in pain. That was the hardest part. Who cares about having your shin bone go through your femur? Having to look your partner in the eyes and go, it's broken. <laughs> It's ripping his heart out of his chest. He says uh, for a while he tried tugging on the rope. So both of them knew this wasn't going to do anything. And descending all the way down to Joe would have led to both of them plunging to their death. So Joe said Simon was able to get down to him after a while. Like they had nothing else to do. They knew this was a bad idea. And he gave him some of the pain meds inside of his bag. They sat for two hours in shock, not saying a word to each other. Oh, man. <laughs> they both knew, like, we're going to have to split up. Uh. So it's the last possible time they could burp together. Joe said he fell into an automatic rhythm of cold rationality. Like the power of friendship says that we should never leave each other's side. <laughs> Rationally, if they want to live, someone's got to go get help. Joe said, we temporarily escaped the hopelessness when Simon lowered down a few ledges. And so he's thinking, maybe we both can do this. But they're like, th we would have to do 3,000 feet of this lowering down. They are going to have to get another helicopter rescue somehow. Joe ends the chapter on a high note. I slid off the crest of the ridge and down the west face. Simon stood back from the edge, bracing himself against my weight. The first of many powder avalanche rushed over me, tugging me down. I slid faster and shouted to Simon to slow down, but he couldn't hear me. Uh-oh. Chapter 5, The Final Choice. They're slowly inching their way down, kicking mini avalanches on their head. Quote, the conditions on the face were markedly different from those on the high slopes of the Colaire. Simon let me slide faster than I had expected, and despite my cries of alarm and pain, he had kept the pace of descent going. I stopped shouting to him after 50 feet. The uh, spindrift's advances drowned out all communications. It was kind of funny, this part. They couldn't communicate. Keep going. You're good. You're good. 
and then he's sliding 40 miles per hour, taking all that impact onto his broken shins. Yeah, they do this repeatedly. Finally, they get to a cliff that looks impassable. And Simon yeet, abseils down to the bottom of it, checks it all out. He's going, there's no way you're going to be able to do this. Quote, I jerked the rope and toppled over backwards, spin spinning in circles from my harness. The rope ran up the lip of the ice. I saw that I was descending. The sight vanished as heavy avalanche of powder poured over me. They tried to go down this death cliff. They only made it 30 meters. And I shouted as the darkness above me and heard an unintelligible muffled yell. I couldn't be sure whether it had been Simon or the echo of my own shout. They're having a real lack of communications. He's hanging 30 meters. Yeah, uh, long quote here. Simon was lowering me again. I shook my head, trying to clear the lethargy. He had no chance. I was sure that he was gambling on being able to get me down before the knot jammed. I secretly hoped he could and knew he certainly couldn't. I screamed a warning into the night. There was no reply. I continued falling steadily. I looked down and saw the crevice below me. I could see it clearly. When I looked up, I could no longer make out the top of the cliff. The ropes ran up into the snow flurries and disappeared. Joe has entered the abyss. They knew they shouldn't have tried to go down this death cliff. Yeah. And now he's stuck in it. Uh, for an hour, there was tension on the rope. And then finally, Joe felt that Simon cut him loose. Damn, son. That's when they finally cut the cord. When he was in the abyss and he needed help the most. Couldn't have done anything else. Joe writes, it was a weird night. It felt strange to think so coldly about what had just happened, as if I were distancing myself from the events. Occasionally I wondered whether Joe was still alive. I know how close we had come to the bottom of the mountain, so it seemed reasonable to hope that he might survive a short fall into the glacier. Could he even now be digging a snow cave himself. God damn. He's not even keeping a positive mentality, going, yeah, Simon must be making it out of here. He's going to go get help. He immediately went into the mental abyss as well. Fuck, both of us are stuck out here. Remember in Bugs Life when he gets stuck in those crevices? That's what it reminds me of. And I watch a ton of these videos on YouTube of people falling into crevices. Oh my god! It's not going to stop me. I'm going to do a Mick twist into Corbett's Calore Jackson Hole. Land on the... <laughs> I'm not that good. Final quote, it was nearly 24 hours since I had taken a drink. In that time, it should have at least one and a half liters of fluid to make up for dehydration. Uh, I smelt the water and the snow around me, and it maddened me. I dozed into an exhausted stupor, only to wake up abruptly to an instant craving for liquid. Not much sleep. The following morning, Joe, he sees a light leaking in. And it's looking out to be a perfect day. <laughs> Sunny inside the avalanche. And he goes, I felt alive. It was a blessing, as if someone was watching to see if I'd get out alive. Woo! Let's go to chapter six, Shadows in the Ice. He should have died at least twice by now. John is surveying the area. Isn't his name Joe? <laughs> Quote, I looked at the crevice beneath me, waiting for me. It was big, 20 feet wide at least, bottomless. I thought idly, no, they're never bottomless. I wonder how deep I will go, to the bottom, to the water at the bottom of the mountain. God, I hope not. -wee! Now he's thinking, I have to go deeper. You know, his legs are broken. It's just starting to get good. Do you feel it? Just trying to transfer some energy here. This book is good enough. <laughs> his mentality is reflecting his position. Thoughts became idle questions, never answered. I accepted that I was to die. There was no alternative. It caused me no dreadful fear. I was numb with cold, felt no pain, so senselessly cold that I have craved sleep and it cared nothing for consequences. It would be a dreamless sleep. Reality had become a nightmare and sleep beckoned. David beckoned. That's still cooler that he's going to go deeper into the crevice to get out. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, 
he's making it through another night alone so he needs to like recuperate and dump some of that adrenaline still from the fall quote then what happened i had waited for pounced on me the stars went out and i fell like something come alive the rope lashed violently against my face i fell silently into nothingness as if i dreamed of falling i fell fast god damn it sometimes i even bamboozle myself yeah he's having a dream here where he's falling again <laughs> it's night number one and he's having ptsd you know the whole thing is like he was yearning for sleep and now his dreams won't let him sleep because he has to get out of the abyss you don't think that it could get any more unhinged than these fever dreams it kept burning quote and i laughed alive well fuck me and i laughed again and a really happy laugh i laughed through the burning and kept laughing hard tears rolled down my face i couldn't see what was so damn funny but i laughed anyway <laughs> laughter you know it's the only medicine <laughs> um i don't know what this is about but he's going deeper into the hole so yeah, he's saying his eyes mostly adjusted to the dark, but he hit his fingers a few times, hammering in the ice. He said once in a while he would break the silence by shouting Simon. And I think this was kind of stupid. Like, don't you think an avalanche is going to pour down on your head? <laughs> Alvin! Alvin and the chipmunks. Simon. <laughs> hey, yo. Which female chipmunk give the best toe curling head? Quote, I shouted his name as loud as I could and the sound jumped back at me and then faded in dying echoes in the holes below. The sound would never be heard through the walls of snow and ice. The roof was 50 feet above me. Ooh, oh, he's just looking up at the no way out. Day four in the hole. Joe turns another corner mentally. He says, I felt calm. It was going to end in the crevice. Perhaps I had always known it would end this way. I felt pleased to be able to accept it calmly. All that sobbing and shouting had been too much. Acceptance seemed better. There was no trauma this way. Yeah. Pessimistic. He's letting the dark side win. Yo, what was that movie that came out to topical this up? Everything, everywhere now. I'm telling you, that's the new Squid Games. Nothing will ever be as big as that more murder porn was. But this was a pretty good movie, and they portray the Zoomers as the bagel, hole-praising, abyss-loving nihilists. The pessimism just ends the storyline. You have to keep believing so that the story can go on. That's the whole name of the chapter to get off of my preach. Shadows in the Ice. He's learning how to integrate the shadow all of the generations that was a really good movie check it out joe another thing that helps him get out of this super abyss the final bagel he was um thinking that simon is back at base camp at this point it's been four days that's how long it takes to get back help might be on the way quote as i descended the sense of menace threatened to overwhelm me uh, he just worked it up to go deeper and the darkness is already coming back bro if you ever taken a really deep psychedelic trip you know these waves of darkness he said in constant to the fury of night before it was unnervingly quiet i expected an avalanche to come hissing down at any moment but nothing moved when you're face to face with the demons the demons aren't that scary anymore. And then the demons go away. <laughs> it's even scarier. He's like, I just want to feel pain at this point. So I know that I'm moving forward. In these survival situations, you know, it just helps to make a decision. Sometimes you got to be on your toes. And that's frustrating. Quote, uh, sitting was torture. And I chose a timeline. I had to stick to it. More of a paraphrase than a quote. Yeah, Joe did have a light on him, so he added some drama there before for nothing. This torch is going to take him deep through the cover of Vosses. That's even more archetypal. He's got the tools. The fourth night, Joe stammers through the caves all night. 
he collapses in exhaustion and wakes up to a small white light. Oh my god, bro, is he dying or is he finally seeing the light? He it's a really dramatic scene, you know, it's like being born again after the abyss. He slowly comes to the vag, the void, crack. He says, I turned away from the drop and glared slight sightlessly at the peak directly in front of me. The cruelty of it all sickened me. It felt as if there was something deliberate about it, something preordained by a bored evil force. <laughs> <laughs> the whole day's effort had been for nothing. Not really, dude. What fools we are to have thought we had been clever enough to get away with it. <laughs> He's still in the void. <laughs> How frustrating. And everybody has a depressed friend. You just want to yank in and fucking rip them out. It's positive time, bitch. It doesn't work like that. You got to let people break their legs and crawl their own way out. <laughs> um, yeah, this guy, he confronted his own shadow in the ice. He went deeper into the abyss with his tools. And he found an alternative way out. This is a badass book. Chapter 6, In the Far Distance. Joe is a new man. He's cleansed his soul. He's never going to feel pain the same way. He says, I began to make a diagonal descent, moving very slowly. The climbing was technically demanding, so I found myself concentrating totally on what I was doing, and the emotions of earlier were forgotten. See, whenever he's focused on the next step, things always go good in the book and like directly the next step not thinking about building his ice cave all of these fucking um, I must be crazy because every book has the same goddamn schema <laughs> uh, quote now that I was virtually clear of the mountain and assumed of my own survival the full impact of what we had been through struck me in the warm and peaceful sun the events of the previous night seemed so distant that I couldn't believe they had been so terrible Everything had changed so much. So remember when I was like, bro, you did do something. It wasn't for a waste. Yeah, he's realizing it now. He says, I almost wished it were still as bad. And then I wish I would still be fighting something. So yeah, it's waves of this. Not knowing if you're doing anything. So what is the best quote I've heard? Um, Creativity is art with a drive. Pretty perfect quote because art is the true fucking making something and then creativity that's putting it into an algorithm uh it's easier to know what you're fighting for than against you've heard all that bullshit before quote in a foggy days of heat and thirst i had forgotten the line we had taken when we approached the mountains the first feeling of panic built up as i stared wildly from one crevasse to another had we gone above or below that one or was it beyond the next i couldn't remember the harder i tried the more confused i became and eventually I was weaving a contorted and terrifying path unsure unsure of where I was heading. Now, I'm not sure if he's taking uh, artistic liberty here. Let's go back to that movie Everything, Everywhere, Now. They break it into three parts. Everything, Everywhere, Now. And in, every, in the Everything part, it's where this guy knows all the tools he has, but he doesn't know the way back to where he came from. Literally, I don't know if this is artistic license, but I got to get fucking Joe Simpson on now to question him. Another quote, the descent had become a confused blur of endless boulder fields, burning midway, sun and thirst. My legs felt weighed down and so weakened, I fell repeatedly among the rocks. Among. When loose rocks slipped suddenly under my feet, I found that I had no strength to prevent myself from falling. Yeah, you kind of forget for a while that this guy has two broken legs. And this was a stretch of the hike that him and Joe were calling Bomb Alley before. <laughs> there was Russian rubles coming off the mountain. Now it's straight up Donkey Kong. He's getting barrels thrown at him. He's settling down for night number five. And he's thinking, all right, Simon definitely has to be at base camp by now. You could tell he's on the whole more positive. Quote, the damaged leg hung slackly above the snow. Despite taking care, I often snagged it or suddenly downward jolted it, pulling the knee forward. And it made him cry aloud every single time. He's going, when I next look at the glacier, I was pleased to see that it was 80 feet from where I stood. Again, just looking at his toes, nose to the grindstone. 
that sucks every step he cried Everest every step you have to take a full breath he's on his own mountain with two hours of daylight left he says a film of weariness enveloped everything events passed in slow motion <laughs> he's on the brink of death here my most frostbitten fingers became the common excuse to stop moving I had to take my mitts and inner gloves off to check where they were getting the most frostbite. I did like a 10 mile, 50 pound ruck for the first time. I had to stop every 100 meters towards the end. I'm not, I know nothing from one step. <laughs> Dude, like you can't move. You don't know until you do it. Quote, don't sleep, don't sleep, not here, keep going, find a slope, dig a snow hole, don't sleep. The darkness and the storm confuse me. I lost track for how longs, I don't know, but I'll keep moving through the snows, no matter what glaciers around me. Hell yeah, bro, you need to get in the rhythm with this book. And Joe says, I lolled against the rock, feeling luxuriously warm and relaxed in the sun. I promised myself a good rest before attempting the moraines, and immediately nodded to sleep. <laughs> he didn't even dig the hole that he was talking about before. Straight up falling asleep on the cold hard ground. Uh. He says, I looked back at the ice cliffs as I hobbled away down the rocks. Each time they grew smaller. Let's go. And I felt that I was shutting the door on something intangible. But something menacing laid ahead. <laughs> Those cliffs were... the. <laughs> Life. Those cliffs were the doors to the mountains. I grinned when I glanced at them. I had won a battle of some sort. I could feel it deep inside. Damn, man. <laughs> Gotta let him celebrate the small victory. He made it out of Bomb Alley. <laughs> it's not quite home yet. Chapter 7, Tears in the Night. Joe has found his override mode. He's in, at the same time, the third part of this 21st century movie and yeah he knows how to just keep pushing past the pain you're gonna have to deal with the injury on the other side but if you don't learn how to push past it now you're not gonna live or have anything to live for if we're talking meta quote look Richard said softly he's not coming back you know it if there was a chance you'd have gone back up yesterday so this was shitty of me but this is Simon talking to Richard back at base camp continuing there's a lot to do we have to inform the embassy and his folks and go through all the legal hassle and get flights booked and all that so they're going we're not going to be able to send a helicopter because of logistics <laughs> um i think this is like manslaughter right if there was a mountain court simon could probably be held liable as well because he cut the cord on his partner you're supposed to go into the void with your partner <laughs> Again, watch that damn movie. Simon, he's a wreck about this situation. He was like crying in a girl's lap. <laughs> Back to Joe. He's in the moraine fields. I would keep moving, keep trying for other choices. I would aim for the upper lake, then cross the moraines, then aim for another lake, then cross the moraines. From the upper moraine lake, I knew that the there was a half an hour of walking to camp or three hours of crawling. I decided to try to reach it by four o'clock. I stood up and hopped from one row. I stood up and hobbled over for one more drink. Yeah, so four o'clock comes super uneventful, and he's not anywhere near as close as he thought. He actually pisses his pants here, which is pretty funny. His bladder was, like, bleeding as well. <laughs> Very funny. It was something like 10 days earlier. He was at this same stream with Richard and Simon. And yeah, now he's pissing himself. Quote, the lake had seemed far longer than it was. And an hour later, I had crossed the dividing moraines and started along the bank of the second lake. I recognized the place where I had attempted to fish for trout and stopped to look ahead at the dam of the moraines. It had taken me 15 minutes to walk the camp from here. How long is it going to take him to crawl? This guy's sense of time is bad, so it's kind of making the story suck. I felt sure I could reach it before dark. I had one hour left. I don't trust you, Joe. We're moving to the next quote. Hours of darkness drifted by, and I lost all sense of time and place. There, he admits it. 
I shuffled in short, inclining sides, peering around at the surrounding darkness and confusion. The idea that I was descending to the tents had long since evaporated. I had no concept of what I was doing and only knew that I must keep moving. Rather than sitting in the void for four days, he's just going to keep moving at this point. Um, this is big. He's on the correct river. He's just m not moving in the correct direction. You know, everybody's crazy until their plan actually works. Quote, I slumped back on the boulder. I knew where I was, but seemed incapable of acting on it. I stared bleakly into the darkness. The cooking rock would be sticking up somewhere ahead of me. But where? Joe shouts into the night. Help me! Alvin! No sleep tonight. Joe makes it a quarter mile up the river bed. He's backtracking now. Quote, a spray of yellow light suddenly came out of nowhere and the colors were in a wide cone more sounds voices not my voice other voices the tents they're still here the thought paralyzed me with shock i toppled sideways off the boulder landing in crumpled heap on the riverbed pain surge up my thigh and i moaned joe is that you joe simon's voice sound cracked with strain i shouted a reply but nothing came out i was sobbing convulsively retching from the spasmodic heavings in my chest incoherent words were mumbled into the dark i turned my head to see a bobbing light approached in a rush yo Joe is saved. Quote, dying couldn't take any more. Too much for me, too much. I thought it was over. Please, for God's sake, help me. He wrote all of this. Simon replied, it'll be okay. I've got you. I have you. You're safe. The power of friendship. Thanks, Simon said. You did right. I saw him turn quickly away, averting his eyes. Ye is guilty. <laughs> I shouldn't have cut the cord. How the fuck did this dead man crawl all the way back? <laughs> That's even funnier. When you, like, take a cowboy and try to Shanghai him in the middle of the desert, and then this guy rides up on a stray horse in five days. That's exactly what motherfucking Joe Simon just did. He climbed out of hell. <laughs> That's badass, man. <laughs> Quote, when Simon pulled my thermal long johns off, we both gawped at my leg in astonishment. Bloody hell. Fuck me. It's enormous. The leg was bloated, stumped, stained yellow and brown, with livid purple-yellow streaks running down from the knee. There was no discernible difference between my thigh and my ankle, only the hugely distended lump, which twisted grotesquely to the right halfway down, showed where the knee had been. <laughs> Joe said it sickened him to look at. Even worse to think about. It's a three-day trek to the hospital. <laughs> and uh, luckily base camp has mules. So they're just going to strap him on top of some ass. They plan to leave in the morning. Simon lets Joe know before going to sleep. You saved my life. You know, if you didn't cut me, then we probably both would have tumbled 2,000 feet like the Japs. Quote, the next two days were a blur of exhaustion and pain. I couldn't squeeze my thighs together to steer the mule, and it seemed to walk into every tree. <laughs> Joey makes it to the hospital in Lima, Peru. He lost 42 pounds, and he waited two days for insurance. Oh, my God. Fix this man. Pretty insane fucking story here. He had, like, six surgeries. He had to be flown home to the States for some of them. Uh, a lot of those aren't really uh, not going to captivate you. That's basically it. What do I say to my girlfriend who lives at the top of the mountain? I'll be coming around the mountain till I come. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was Joe Simpson's Touching the Void. Definitely a fun episode here. I hope you guys learned something about pushing through, breaking those inner walls, making it out of the abyss. I don't know what you're going through out there, but I hope some levity helps you every single week. Too honest and gay. Uh, definitely go check out that movie, Everything Everywhere, all the time. 
And as for next week. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we have Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception. Bring on through to the other side. This is the book that the doors are named after. Aldous Huxley, he wrote Brave New World. It was supposed to be a cautionary tale. It's a fucking user's manual. 1984! 1984! It's everywhere. If the power elite would take notes from the doors of perception, we might have like a hippie wet dream world out here. Why are we reading his bad books? Aldous Huxley, this guy, he's fucking tapped in. <laughs> I'll probably share some of my deeper dives. This will definitely be a good one. Don't miss it. Thank you guys for tuning in for another edition. Our June theme, spread that positive ripple. The knickers out there. Let's get a random soundboard effect. I'm a racehorse. You can't stop me on this goddamn platform. Keep on subscribing. Smash that motherfucking share button. Most of all, improve your own lives. Try to read some books and get outside. Guys, I love you. I hope to see you next week for another special edition of Nick's Nonfiction. Take it easy out there. Peace.